next we have Kimball Clark, who is going to be introducing the Hex Congo, the all-in-one habitat for solitary bees. Thank you everybody for participating today. My name is Kimball Clark. Uh, I have been developing the Hex Condo uh, for probably see, since about 2007 is when I started to design solutions uh, for solitary bees. Um, this presentation is going to comprise uh, kind of some screens as well as kind of a video that I'm just going to show in live kind of how the condo works. Um, I just want to give a quick background of the, the traditional hives that we've had in the past. Um, we're going to jump right into the skep. Um, as those of you who are probably much more uh, able with Apis mellifer than I am, um, the skep was a very awkward shape. Uh, it was not easy to stack. It required what are called bowls, where the basically the skep hive would fit inside of a container of sorts. Um, and then it didn't have any removable frames. So I'll just give you a quick example of what that looked like. So here we have. Um, <clears throat> These are called bowls, or basically uh, an environment wherein the skep can reside and the, 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 the honeybees can live, requires a certain amount of excessive work. Uh, they actually put these into kind of brick places, brick walls, stone walls, mud, um, or wood structures to put these skep hives inside of. So those are called bee bowls, um, which, which required a little bit of extra labor. Um, of course, there was a point where um, a lot of beekeepers started to realize that the skeps were actually causing more problems than they were helping. Uh, it was difficult to observe the hive and to control the mites and disease. Uh, I am based out of the state of Utah in, this, in the country of the USA, and the flag itself has a skep hive on it, as you can see. And uh, it's actually technically illegal in our state, which I think I kind of find funny. They just redesigned our flag and they, they continue to include the skep hive, which is fine uh, from a historical perspective. It's fine and it has some symbolic meaning there, but the skep in and of itself is not healthy for a good, to rear out a good population of honeybee hives. So of course we all know that uh, <clears throat> the Langstroth hive came about and was, was invented and uh, it has a very basic shape. It's just basically a stackable cube, if you will. The bowl was, of course, unnecessary. It had removable frames, and of course, it was transportable, which leads to what we have today, where 70 to 80 percent, at least the way that I understand it, uh, 70 to 80 percent of all uh, Apis mellifera hives travel to the San Joaquin Valley to pollinate the almonds. Um, so that's a, a very nice advancement uh, from the skep to the Langstroth hive. Now, without talking about honeybees too much, I'm gonna jump into a little bit more about solitary bees. So solitary bees, um, I'm using that term very loosely. Uh, it implies solitary tunnel nesting bees. I don't necessarily like to call them cavity nesting, but more so tunnel nesting because they typically nest inside of uh, tunnels that are created by beetles um, in, in nature. They also nest in reeds and uh, stems of grasses and whatnot of various sizes. So they are specifically tunnel nesting bees. Um, among the genus that is more popular that nests in tunnels are Megachylae and Osmia. Um, they have discovered, scientists have discovered that Osmia and Megachylae can be specialist pollinators for certain crops. A good example of this would be the alfalfa leaf cutter, which has changed the entire industry of alfalfa seed. Uh, whereas one day they used to bring in uh, loads of Apis mellifera and Langstroth hives to alfalfa fields. They now bring trailers full of uh, open cell solitary bee nesting habitats, <clears throat> specifically engineered for uh, Megachylae rotundata or the alfalfa leaf cutter. Okay, um, so that was an example of a particular crop that benefited in a huge way from solitary bees. Uh, they've discovered that these Osmia and Megachylae are excellent pollinators, and in most cases, supplemental pollinators in addition to Apis. So having them exclusive, having using exclusively Osmia or Megachylae on a crop isn't always the best in all cases. They've discovered that actually having a variety of species is a little better, particularly um, Claire Kremen's research in almonds. 
Um, Osmia is also not as aggressive as Apis, meaning it's going to sting less. You'll also generally have more males than females, which of course do not have a stinger, um, particularly uh, when you're when you're managing Osmia. And of course, the female Osmia are not just simply not as aggressive as Apis. However, their venom is arguably uh, equal, um, except for Apis can continue to pump the venom into your body as the stingers uh, in your body, whereas Osmia does not work that way. They're not um, the type of bees where they will inject their stinger and die and leave their stinger in you. They actually retract their stinger into their body and continue on their merry way uh, with the ability to potentially sting again, but the stinger, of course, is not left behind in you. So nonetheless, Osmia is not as aggressive, which is nice uh, for those of the, the farmers who are on the call today. Uh, they might like, like to know that. Um, there are also various tunnel sizes for various solitary bees. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those uh, species. This is the more common Osmia lignaria there on the left, otherwise known as the blue orchard bee, the orchard bee, the blue bee, the mason bee. Um, now, the, the bees on the right are more rare Osmia species. Um, this one is called Osmia rhizoflorus, something that I have been working on for uh, almost a decade now. Um, and then these two down here are actually a male and female of the same species, Osmia aglaea, interestingly enough. We also work with another one called Osmia bruneri. There are more rare species. Uh, and what we've discovered is that <clears throat> Osmia rhizoflorus has more of a, a predilection for a lesser quantity of forage, whereas the Osmia lignaria is more of a polylectic bee. Uh, and the, and the Osmia rhizoflorus is almost arguably more of an oligolectic bee. Uh, the Aglaea uh, is somewhat more uh, polylectic, but it also has its preferences. So each Osmia or Megachile species, depending on what kind of research you do, you'll discover that they actually have their various predilections. So if I were to be a cherry farmer, I would probably want the Osmia lignaria. Uh, if I were to be a blueberry farmer, I would want the Osmia riboflorus. If I were a raspberry blackberry farmer, I would want the Osmia aglaea and potentially the Osmia bruneri, something that we're working with. Um, let me talk a little bit now about the hex condo. <clears throat> the hex condo, similar to, you'll see a lot of similarities between the Langstroth hive and the hex condo. It's a basic hexagonal shape, something that people are used to. Uh, I, I will say after exper experimenting with the hexagon enough, a lot of people find the hexagon confusing. Um, so it's good that we only have six sides or less. We don't have uh, any more than six. Uh, it is also modular and stackable. Uh, we, those of us who are honeybee keepers generally know why the honeybee uses a hexagon opposed to any other shape. It's the best shape to contain the most volume and also provide the most rigid structure so that the offspring can survive and the honey can also be retained. Um, obviously, if you were to do a series of circles, you'd have a lot of gaps between the circles that would create various problems, whereas the hexagon, again, creates structure and a good capac holding capacity. Um, the hex condo also has a built-in bowl, similar to the honeybee hive or the honeybee skeps, where you'd put them into a, a container. It's kind of built into the system, similar to the Langstroth, which also is sort of a built-in bowl, if you will, which is the box itself. And of course, the intent of that is to protect against weather and animal attacks, animal intrusion. Uh, it's got removable frames. Um, it's got an, it enables you to extract cocoons in an open cell manner. It's the same problem with the skep hive where because you couldn't manage in the frames or the, the comb of the honeybees, um, you were unable to look for mites, et cetera, uh, whereas this you can. So being able to extract the cocoons is very important with solitary bee management. It's also shippable flat, this particular system. You can transport it in the field potentially. Uh, there are still different behaviors with different solitary bees where we're still learning whether, whether or not we can transport them. One thing I didn't mention is you can also even close off the front of it in the field when you're spraying no noxious sprays that could potentially hurt the species. You can literally close up the nest uh, in the hex condo design. And we'll show you that here in a moment. Um, it is in fact a bee quote melting pot it enables uh, you to uh, really provide a destination for multiple types of species to nest from. That is very important when we're talking about diverse species 
and forage and how important that is to be able to get pollination at different times of the year. Uh, so you can have spring bees and you can have summer bees with this solution. So from February all the way up to June, July, August, you could actually have this hex condo out inviting and encouraging many different kinds of species. Um, we have a diverse set of nesting options. So we have, um, right now we presently use poplar and alder. Uh, you also allow the bees to nest in the wood itself, the wood tunnels. You can also insert straws into our solution and you can also have reeds if you would like. It is breathable. There's no mold that will incur, will uh, aggregate on these nests uh, because I made sure that we put in parts that allowed it to breathe. Um, and then of course it's attractive to bees and it's a large enough field reference for the bees. Now, here's an example of the hex condo on the left. What we have here is Osmia bruneri who's nested inside of these. You'll notice that there are larger diameter tunnels that are blank or empty. They don't have any bees nesting there. And that's because your spring bees are typically nesting earlier in the year, whereas this particular nest was pulled out later in the year. And the summer bees, at least where I live, will typically nest in the smaller diameter holes. So of course, the smaller diameter holes have straws where you can insert them and, and therefore decrease the diameter of the tunnel. Now, here's an example of the bee condo in the field, in a field. This is a raspberry, no, a blackberry field out in Utah, uh, commercial operation. Um, and let's, let's study this real quick. So we've got these little boxes here. These are called emergence boxes. Um, you'll notice that these tunnels are a little larger diameter. These are a little smaller diameter. Um, we've also got reeds in there as an option. Sometimes people like to release bees from reeds uh, and then they'll nest in these uh, open cell solutions. Behind these wood, um, fronts, you have a loose cell solution, and I'll show you that here in a video. Uh, so what you have here is an all-in-one uh, cocoon release, um, what we call emergence box. The bee will fly out, pollinate, will collect its pollen, nest inside of these tunnels, pull the pollen off its belly, and scrape it into a pollen ball, lay its egg, and the egg will um, hatch, eat the pollen, go through the metamorphosis process, inside of this container the entire time. Now, we do have some options where you can put a lid over this entire front hexagon. Uh, I'm gonna show you another example of, of a benefit of these uh, the hex condo. So this is inside of its quote bowl, if you will. Um, and what's nice about these is we're, they're designed in a way that you can sort of connect them together or sort of stack them in sort of like Legos. And they stack together, and this is um, this is probably three, six, nine, twelve, fourteen, about seven, a little under twenty um, nests or hex condos or hex houses we call them here. And uh, it's and of course we we net them off to make sure that no other critters can get inside of them. And if there are critters inside of them, they're merely going to be able to to get into whatever is available. But when they're shut like this together, they can't really get into other nests. So it's a nice solution when it comes to high volume of these uh, of these hex condos. We'll just jump into questions. It looks like I've got 